Good afternoon and welcome back to the Barfish Crowdcast. We've got a slightly different setup for today, which I'm delighted because this is our last Crowdcast. Gosh, we've been doing this the whole of the year. Um, so thank you for joining us. But I really wanted to uh, finish on um, a really good summary and set us up for success going forward for 2021. So I'm delighted. I've got Tom Simmons here from Deloitte. Um, hi, how are you doing? Hi, Wendy. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for having me. Oh, no, it's an absolute pleasure because I think um, I'm very much an advocate of bringing experts from out with the recruitment sector to reflect and help us within our sector uh, and see where what we should be doing, what's happening um, and how we can plan for next year. So, you know, Tom, you've got a wealth of experience. You've been in the economics uh, research team within Deloitte since 2017. And before that, you've done some amazing stuff over in uh, the oil and gas sector, the financial sector. Um, so lots and, you know, with Lloyd's as well. So, you know, lots of depth there. Um, and I think um, you were just talking there in the green room. You've been exceptionally busy this year in helping um, advise lots of people make sense of a very strange year. Yeah, ho hopefully. I mean, it's no no mean feat, but um, yeah, it's it's a really interesting time to be an economist. So hopefully some of that might be might be useful for today's call. Oh, I'm sure it will. So to the audience out there, um, this is going to be slightly different because, you know, if anybody's been tuning into our Crowdcast before, I'm generally sort of there hosting and asking questions. But I think with econ you know, with with uh, um, with economics and with lots of data and everything else, actually, it is better to see something visual. So I've asked Tom just to put um, some of the main sort of points that we're going to cover um, on what's happened this year, what's happened with the jobs and where we may be seeing the things um, predictions for next year. Um, and we're going to do that in the sort of first 20 minutes on a sort of slide basis. Please, I'm sure you will have lots of questions. So make sure you're using the comments or the ask a question um, at the bottom. Um, Amy, who's on, on the uh, uh, comment session, and I'll be sort of monitoring the questions. We will then have a good 15, 20 minutes with Tom afterwards to sort of just unpick what he's been saying and see where that really falls for affecting the recruitment um, uh, market for us next year. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Tom if that's all right. And if you're okay to share your screen, um, and hopefully that will take us, um, make us small and make, make the screen big and we can start to have a wee look at your presentation. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Um, so hopefully that's... Perfect. That's great. Brilliant. So thank you very much, Wendy. Um, as Wendy said, I'd like to just give a brief overview of what's happened to the global economy this year and how it's interacted with the pandemic, what that might tell us about what to expect next year before then focusing on the UK economy and the outlook for 2021, and then drill down a little bit into the labour market um, before touching on finally some structural changes that we might expect in the labour market as a result of the current crisis. That sounds awesome. Fantastic. So the first and probably the most obvious thing to, to note is on the left-hand side of the slide. So this year, or in the first half of this year, economic activity has collapsed across the world without exception, really. Um, so this is forecast to be the worst year for the global economy since the Great Depression. So much more significant than we saw during 2008 and 9. Um, and I think what this chart does is it shows the, the scale of the decline, but it also shows the divergence in the performance of different countries. So. If you look down the bottom of the chart, unfortunately, as we know, the UK has performed quite poorly this year, um, Spain and India also. But then at the top of the chart, countries like Japan and the US and Germany have done relatively well. And that of, is, of course, partly due to the composition of their economies. So the UK has a much larger focus on the services sector, which um, not entirely, but largely is driven by face to face interaction. Um, but it's also driven by health policy. And I think this chart on the right is really interesting and it helps to inform our understanding of what to expect next year. On the X axis, we have the average change in mobility. So these are Google mobility data, which measure the level of um, movement in different uh, locations. And on the Y axis, we have the hit to activity in the first half of this year. And what you can see is those countries at the bottom left have suffered large contractions in economic activity and that has been correlated with a large restriction in movement. 
so conversely what we can take from this is good health policy is good economic policy so we know lockdowns impact activity but i think it's just quite powerful to look at how strong the correlation is between physical movement and economic activity so clearly a huge determinant of growth next year in different countries will be the ability of authorities to handle the spread of the pandemic So yes, activity collapsed in the first half of this year, but over the summer months, we've seen a, a rebound and actually quite a robust rebound in a lot of countries. So these uh, data are PMIs, purchasing manager indices. They are just a broad measure of activity in the economy. Um, and what they show is any number under 50 being a contraction and any number above 50 being an expansion in activity. We see um, the UK and the Euro area recovering very strongly in the summer months. And that was due largely to a benign window. So we had low levels of infection due to the lagged impact of the lockdown. Uh, we had front loaded fiscal stimulus, huge amounts of government spending that we could talk about a bit later on. Um, we also had pent up demand from um, consumers and households that simply weren't able to spend in the way they, they might have liked. We also had the, the Bank of England um, cutting interest rates. So a really robust recovery over the summer months, but clearly things have begun to slow. And actually the recovery in the UK was slowing even before the November lockdown. So the high frequency data suggested that actually as those summer months began to tail off, uncertainty begin, began to rise as caseloads um, also increased. And we now expect the UK economy to contract in the fourth quarter of this year. So. That's also the case in Europe. We've had similar um, but slightly varied um, levels of lockdowns across European countries. Interesting to note the US and China. Uh, China is actually expected to grow this year, which is somewhat remarkable given it was the epicenter of the crisis. Um, and the US is, is expected to recover more quickly than, than Europe. Um, but a recovery over the summer, nevertheless. So just to talk about the UK outlook and what we expect, I, <laughs> I, I I think you might have heard a lot of alphabet soup coming from economists as to what to expect after the huge contraction in the first half of the year. And I suppose you might call this a W-shaped recovery or maybe a, a, a K shape or an, a Nike tick. Um, <laughs> but what effectively we're saying is that, yes, we've had this really robust rebound of activity over the seven months, but the economy is still 10% smaller than it was at the beginning of February. So a lot of lost activity not regained. We think that the November lockdown and the elevated restrictions throughout the rest of the winter will weigh on activity quite heavily. But we then see the recovery gaining traction in the spring. Um, as the warmer weather returns, we know that matters to the epidemiology based on our experience this year and this summer. But also as crucially, the vaccine is rolled out to more vulnerable cohorts of the population. So the incredibly positive news of effective vaccines and their rollout means that all else equal, we expect the government to be able to implement lower levels of restriction to um, to, to help to bolster that recovery. So I think what, what those vaccine announcements have done is reduce the probability of a downside scenario, one which was quite probable um, in the absence of a vaccine. So I think the economy will contract by about 11.6% this year and grow by around 4.5% next year. Um, so that means that the economy won't return to its pre-crisis size until um, the end of 2022. So quite a slow recovery. And just to just to join in on that, just in your last slide, actually, it's quite interesting because we have been monitoring the job flow, or, or you know, really along this, and it's it's a very um, it's a very similar sort of story in terms of the number of jobs to number of sort of activities within the recruitment sector as well. Um, but actually. It, in the latter sort of um, latter months, November was still showing a strong sort of job opportunity there, which is great to see and demonstrating the, the comeback and the bounce back, you know, the potential that is there. So it's really been quite interesting to see how the jobs have fallen, you know, fallen through that sort of same picture. That's really that's really interesting. And I suppose it, it also speaks to the fact that we think this lockdown and this period of restrictions will be far less destructive than the first. Um, that's a because quite obviously they are just less restrictive. You can do more things. More industries have been able to carry on as normal in inverted 
mm-hmm. commerce, um, so manufacturing, real estate, uh, schools, universities, etc. Um, and there's simply less activity to destroy because the economy is somewhat smaller than it was. Um, but also we think there'll be less um, avoidable disruption. Again, avoidable is probably not the best term, but businesses have proven to be hugely adaptable since the lockdown in March in finding workarounds, of course, the huge working from home movement, um, but also kind of more subtle changes in adapting office buildings such that we think, um, and it's really interesting, it squares with your view on jobs, Wendy, that this lockdown won't be anywhere near as as painful as yeah. as we saw in the in the spring Good. Um, so I think quite an important point to make is that as we see the recovery being uneven in terms of geography um, as per the first slide that's also the case by sector so this chart from the ONS I think is is quite helpful in describing in yellow, the impact to activity in the first quarter of this year. So, I mean, if you look at a combination of food services at the bottom, activity in that sector dropped by about 90%. So, you know, huge, huge destruction of activity. But what's maybe more useful is to look at the gray bar, which shows the fall in activity from January to November. So it shows a uh, recovery of sorts. Um, And what you can see is that actually for sectors like manufacturing and construction uh, and education, actually that recovery has come back pretty quickly. Um, So the the gap between the yellow and the grey bar, the larger that is, the more that that sector has managed to recover thus far. So I think this is quite helpful in thinking about what we expect next year. So clearly the the pandemic and the lockdowns have impacted certain sectors um, more severely. And I think it just stands to reason that as we anticipate government to continue some level of um, restrictions throughout certainly the first half of next year, those sectors will be slower in regaining their pre-COVID levels of activity. So on to the jobs market. Um, I think the, the jobs market data have confounded economists because the usual numbers that we look at just, just tell a completely different story to what's going on in reality. And of course, that is due to the uh, success of the Chancellor's furlough scheme. So the first thing that the scheme has done quite evidently has been to suppress unemployment. So in this chart, on the blue line on the left hand scale you can see unemployment actually in the in the 10 years up to 2020 the remarkable success of the uk economy has been to continually lower the unemployment rate to historically low standards so in february unemployment was close to four percent which was its lowest level in i think 47 years so the economy had done a great job in creating jobs but clearly that has started to rise. Um, And the the latest data I have, the latest data have it, pardon me, at about 4.8%. So that is a material increase. But of course, it's nowhere near the level that we might think it would be at given the destruction to economic activity. And I think what's quite useful to look at here is the vacancies data. Mm -hmm. So the green line shows how many vacancies there are at the moment in their thousands. And What we understand as economists is a quite a a tight relationship, understandably, between vacancies and unemployment. Now, vacancies have started to rise recently, um, but they fell to multi-decade lows. And (laughs) I'm aware this looks like a very dull economics chart, but but actually, I think it it is quite instructive. Um, What you see here is vacancies on the left-hand side and unemployment on the right. And... What this is telling us is that there's a really strong relationship between the number of vacancies and the level of un- unemployment. But what you have on the left hand side of this chart is this clustering of um, low levels of vacancy, but also low levels of unemployment, which doesn't really fit the picture. So if we look at the August dot, well, if the furlough scheme wasn't in place, where might this relationship suggest unemployment might be? Um, and if you look at the line of best fit, it's around 8%. So a good three percentage points higher than it than it currently see is in the statistics um, and that's clearly millions and millions of people so i think that's that's quite useful in thinking about in the absence of the furlough scheme where might unemployment be um, i think a, another crucial 
thing that the furlough scheme has done has been to maintain the link between employers and employees. So in traditional recessions, we see that um, hiring takes a lot longer than firing. That is to say, the unemployment rate takes a lot longer to fall than it does to rise. And that's due in part to the frictions, um, which I suppose, Wendy, the, the recruitment industry is specialising in, in trying to reduce. Um, and I think what the furlough scheme has done is, is try to maintain those linkages such that when demand picks back up, and actually, I think what we've seen over recent weeks from the positive news of the vaccine announcement is a, a really improvement in sentiment. So I suppose we are hopeful that the reduction of uncertainty from the vaccine announcements might improve the probability of employers keeping some employees on their books um, at the end of March when the furlough scheme winds down. Yeah, it's, so, all about, it's all about sort of insta installing the confidence in the employers to keep the jobs there and keep the jobs going that they're going to be going forward um, because that's really what, you know, that forms the supply and demand within our sector. Right, yeah, confidence is a, is a huge mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, and, and what this OBR chart does is it maybe kind of illustrates that that point around how those linkages have been maintained and how that might help going forward. So, um, unfortunately, this this slide relates slightly to the dreaded word Brexit, um, which we, we can talk about if we if we like a bit later on. Um, I did actually have it in my list to go oh, right. Right, now. Okay. We've heard all of this. <laughs> right. You know this other grenade that we're going to throw in, but we can keep that till afterwards. <laughs> okay, that, that's a nice surprise for later. Um, but but what this shows is what the OBR. So the Chancellor announced uh, his spending review the week before last and obviously the office for budget responsibility published their their findings alongside that speech and they think unemployment will rise to seven and a half percent in the second quarter of next year wow. once the furlough scheme ends which is a really sharp rise so clearly that's problematic for the wider economy but also it's it's a challenge i'd imagine for the for the recruitment industry yeah. um so there's no getting away from it the huge stress that we've seen in the economic data in the first half of the year the um, damage to the jobs market and actually to corporate insolvencies has been delayed and hopefully limited by the fiscal action of government. But that is to say that we would expect unemployment to rise pretty sharply as the furlough scheme winds down at the end of the first quarter of next year. The OBR also um, proposed some different scenarios and they're related to, to Brexit and um, up and downside scenarios for the vaccine for the virus pardon me and the spread of spread of case numbers um but what's important to see i think is that actually this shows unemployment coming down relatively quickly so helpfully unemployment is not likely to stay at very high levels as it did if i could just pop back to this one quickly after the financial crisis what the obr is saying is that the different nature of this crisis and indeed the fiscal response should mean that although unemployment is likely to rise it's likely to rise to a smaller degree than we saw during the global financial crisis and come down um, more quickly um, yeah and, that, and that's a really important thing because essentially you know we everyone in the industry knows the sort of bounce back is really good in recruitment and it's all you know it suddenly it's like the taps turned on and we're almost the first to feel it um, and I think from interpreting that is that, yeah, we're going to dip down here, but that it's going to be a much quicker rise in terms of uptake of new jobs, new demand and get things going again. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I suppose, and maybe we'll touch on it a bit later, how, how this crisis might actually change jobs and mm -hmm. different industries. Some may be growing, outpacing their pre pre COVID level of natural kind of expansion and, and others the opposite. Um, yeah. That would be great to touch on. Uh, and pardon me, this, this chart um, just looks at furloughing. So as we saw, economic activity has varied by sector. Um, so to have job prospects or the level of employees that have been furloughed in each sector. And this is kind of as you might expect, but I just found the numbers to be quite striking. So as you can see in the arts, entertainment and recreation, this is a survey measure. So this is the ONS's business interruption from COVID survey. Some close to a third of um, employees are currently being furloughed in that space, which is perhaps unsurprising given how limited they are in, in opening up shop. 
Um, and right at the other end of the spectrum, perhaps more encouragingly, um, as well as the huge amount of economic destruction, there's also been growth in, in some sectors for, for obvious reasons. And there you see professional services having a very low relative level of furloughing um, as human health and IT and construction do. So I think that's that's really positive in so much as if you see the headline furlough numbers, they're pretty scary. Um, and obviously some industries are going through a pretty tough time, but at the other end of the spectrum, there are sectors that are certainly mu much less affected. Yeah. So, and I'm aware we've, we've done 20 minutes already, Wendy, but um, I've just got three more slides on structural change and what we might think um, will come out of this crisis. Yeah, I think, brilliant, because I think every, every crisis does have lasting change. We saw it after the financial crisis. Um, and there was a kind of a shrinking of the financial sector, much greater regulation um, and reform of the mortgage markets. And what we see this time around um is i think some some quite interesting dynamics for migration so over the last kind of 20 20 years or so employment growth has been largely down to non-uk nationals so the uk has benefited from a really flexible and large supply of labor um, from the rest of the world but of course more prominently from the european union so you can see the dark blue line, which barely gets above 1%, which shows the annual growth of employment in the UK for UK nationals. And then you can see the light blue line, which is non-EU, and the green line, which is EU nationals. So this is effectively saying that the growing demand for labour in the UK has been matched almost entirely over the last couple of decades from migrant labour from the EU and from non-EU countries. Now, I think that's really interesting when we consider the impact, um, A, of the pandemic. So we've seen record low levels of migration across the world um, because of the pandemic. I think in uncertain times, people just tend to tend to migrate less. Um, and also if there is uh, a collapse in economic activity in even the richer countries, then there are harder, more difficult conditions to find work. Um, but, but also I think it's quite interesting if you look at the green line, and you can almost directly trace that peak um, or the most recent peak back to the uh, Brexit referendum. And of course, that's not surprising, but what we saw was a, a sharp fall in sterling um, and you know, greatly increased uncertainty around the future of um, EU nationals working in the UK. And since the, since the pandemic, we've seen a really sharp decline in both EU and non-EU nationals working in the UK. So, Yes, we expect the jobs market to reflect the the kind of output gap in the economy and the softer um, softer level of activity next year. But the supply story, I think, is really interesting. And if we're suddenly turning off this very um, flexible, uh, large, and biddable supply of labour, what impact does that have on wages and and job frictions? This is I won't spend much time on this, but this is just quite an interesting chart from the Bank of England. So there's a lot of talk about what this crisis might mean in transforming the labour market. Will there be completely redundant skills that were really highly demanded prior to the pandemic? And what this Bank of England chart shows is, this is their own measure, but it attempts to measure the level of um, kind of reallocation of tasks and skills in the economy and what they do is they assume spending patterns are changed um, forever as they are in q3 2020 so significant change in our spending habits more spending online etc less service um, sector spending and what they're saying is there will be a significant change in the reallocation of tasks and therefore in what new skills might be near anywhere near the type of reallocation we saw during the 80s when there was a big shift from manufacturing and heavy industry to more service-based sector activity. So I think that is quite interesting in that despite it being a far larger economic shock, we don't expect as big a reallocation of resources within the economy. That being said, you know, there is still going to be a significant shift to the composition of the economy, one which I think poses some, some opportunities for um, job seekers, recruiters uh, and educators, perhaps. Um, so this is just my last slide, and I, th I think everyone's probably familiar with 
with this working from home story, but just some data from, from our end. So this is from our consumer tracker on the left-hand side. And it's quite interesting and it breaks down some of the reasons as to why people might want to continue working from home. Um, so clearly they are in favor of flexible working, but there are also some drawbacks um, further down the list. Um, and I think that's something that has perhaps not been highlighted as much as the benefits from working from home. So clearly there's been a huge shift in working from home and lots of people have found it to be a pretty transformational experience and there'll be much more working from home in the future. Um, but this quote um, from the Bank of England chief economist has blamed um, the lack of diffusion of knowledge in the UK for the UK's poor economic performance, productivity performance over recent decades. And he argues that actually a vital part of economic growth and companies growing their revenues is to have people in the same room or in the same building sharing ideas, ways of best practice and knowledge of kind of the, the company's operating procedures, which I think does hold some, some water. Um, and this is just from our survey. So we run a fortnightly uh, COVID webinar, which I think gets about 700 um, uh, viewers. So pretty good sample size and it's showing that people on the whole would like to work for um, two or three days uh, in the office once the pandemic proceeds. Um, and clearly all of this has not done much for um, soup manufacturers. And so if you're, heading, <laughs> if you're heading back to the office soon, it's probably a good time to snap up um, a, a suit or some, some office wear. So that's inflation for that kind of product, which has fallen pretty sharply. Um, I probably, this, is, this is my last slide. This is just from our CFO survey, which we ask chief financial officers of some of the largest companies in the UK every, um, every quarter, what they think about their attitudes toward risk, um, strategy, valuations. I think the, the last survey was about 20% of the quoted UK equity market. So again, it's a good sample. Unsurprisingly on the left, they are focusing on cutting costs, increasing cash flow, but they are somewhat focused on increasing, sorry, introducing new products and services, which perhaps speaks to this idea of a slight shift in, in how um, the economy might operate. Um, and also on the right to this structural change point, yes, um, they will continue to spend money on software, data, and IT, which is unsurprising given the shift home working. And at the bottom of the chart, they are expecting to spend a lot less money on land, businesses, and infrastructure. So again, it just consolidates this working from home point. So just to conclude, we think there'll be a W-shaped w recovery, um, a better balance of activity and containment than there was in the first quarter, and the great news of a vaccine um, boosts, um, boosts certainty around that outlook. Uh, but there will be major challenges to come. Some of the unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy has delayed the stress that we will see in the labor market and in corporate insolvencies next year. And the last point is just that these, these major crises typically do produce large change. Um, so Wendy, I'm, I'm afraid I've gone over a bit, but that's that was... all right. We won't, we'll, that's absolutely brilliant. And, and thank you, Tom, for that. Do you want to, if you um, just un unshare your slide cool. and come back on, thank you so much for that. And and in many ways, um, you know, there's a lot of sobering data there. Um, and I've seen some good chat and the, the chat about that in terms of the way that we look at it. But I always state, look, you know, data is valuable to us because then we know how to adapt and how to plan for next year. Um, you know, rose tinted glasses is not maybe the structure that we are the the focus that we want and we want to know what we're playing at and seize the opportunities and that is what the recruitment sector is all about so thank you for sharing that I've got a couple of questions just on the data just to help um so um, in terms of the majority of that data do you know tom roughly when you were taking that sort of like your cfo sort of survey was that sort of after you know was that in the middle of the year was that after lockdown because that would have influenced that sort of strategy from the CFOs in terms of most companies? Do you know roughly when that was? It's a really good question. So those CFO survey responses were during the uh, beginning of October. So it would have been after a pretty pretty good summer in the context of 2020, but beginning to rise. Um, and we had not had this kind of um, positive news of a vaccine. So yeah. it was in so the context of because I think well, I've, I, you know, I've, I, I listened to the Deloitte's um, fortnightly um, so CEO um, briefing, which has been incredibly valuable, valuable for me and uh, every fortnight as well. And, and I think you can see how quickly things shift from, you know, the online polls that you do from month to month. So that, that's mm -hmm. good to know in terms of where, where that was taken. Another one, we've got some audience in from South Africa. Um, just wanted to know the data in terms of location. Did that, um, did that include African countries or was it more UK and European? 
so, so most of the data I referred to is just the UK. Um, so I had a couple on on kind of PMIs for China, US, Europe, um, yeah. but that was just a UK outlook, I'm afraid. Nope, that's perfect. That's great. Um, and we've got somebody on from the States as well, Ernie, um, and uh, he was hoping to um, hoping that the new administration would bring any economics. So that's specific really sort of to America. I'm not sure if that's your focus, Tom, but, you know, your gut feel in terms of new administration there. How do you think that's going to maybe sort of affect the economy coming in? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think um, Biden has a lot of um, pretty ambitious spending plans, um, but we will see whether he is allowed to implement them um, in the in the kind of with what happens with the Senate. But I think his policies are, you know, pro growth. There's an awful lot of uh, spending on green energy, um, green projects. And one thing we're struck by is that actually, and it's universal amongst developed economies, after the global financial crisis, uh, governments were pretty uh, unanimous in their want for austerity to bring back public expenditure. Actually, what we're seeing this time around is, is probably the opposite. So for various reasons, which include ultra low borrowing costs, um, bond yields for sovereign debt at pretty low levels, governments, including the UK and indeed the Biden's administration in the US, have um, pledged to increase public spending in order to um, secure that economic recovery. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see as to which of those plans come to fruition, but um, certainly some ambition, ambitious spending agendas. And that's quite interesting in that sort of um, uh, the government's sort of stating to spend. I mean, that's certainly the sort of impact that we're seeing from the UK government's strategy in terms of reinvesting into the UK to kick the economy off. Um, uh, next year as well. So I want to unpick a few of those stats and to see sort of where the opportunities may lie for us, because, you know, what I was certainly seeing from some of those graphs was that, yeah, you know, the the unemployment is going to go up, um, but we're going to also miss because, you know, Brexit is happening and, you know, we're, we're, we're going out of the, you know, the uh, EU. So we're going to have a big hole there for when a lot of these sort of EU um uh, talent and and resource came in to work in the UK. That's gonna that's going to create a huge gap for us to fill, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's a really interesting question. I think just briefly on Brexit. So clearly, we are none the wiser as to whether there will be a deal or or, or not up to this point. Um, I think you know whether it is a thin free trade deal or no deal, there will be a much um, less close economic relationship with the EU regardless on January 1st, so there will be greater frictions. And in the event of a no deal, um, so our forecast assumes a thin freight deal, in the event of a no deal, we'd likely see about a 2% hit to economic activity um, compared to our kind of main scenario. Um, but on jobs, it's, it's, it's a really good question. So clearly that impact will affect demand. So there'll be slightly less demand. But as you say, the, the, the supply of labor has been critical from the European Union in, in matching the growth in demand. So we, we know that um, in general, European Union economic migrants typically have um, the lower skilled, less well-paid jobs um, due to the less onerous entry requirements, whereas the non-EU, non-UK workers typically have the higher paid jobs at the other end of the spectrum due to the, the more stringent visa requirements. So we're likely to see, I would imagine, a, a fall in the supply of labor for those um, lower skilled jobs primarily. And I think you've seen that with the government trying to address the seasonal kind of um, picking programs that agricultural um, companies are saying will be will be kind of hampered by. So some, some really interesting questions about which kind of which jobs might see a, a limit in the supply of labor. Yeah. And let's take it up a notch in terms of one of the other things I've picked up on there is the um, transformation of these jobs, you know, with a, with prices and opportunity, things change, um, you know, jobs are going to be changing, aren't they, next year? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, the government's policies thus far have focused on job retention, which is clearly incredibly important. But um, I think perhaps there's been less progress so far in in job creation and maybe that's what the government's um, fiscal agenda and its green uh, 10 point revolution was supposed to engender um, but if you look um, slightly concerningly at the data the spike or the the sharp rise in unemployment over the last few months to around five percent has been driven um, 
in some part by the youngest in the labour market. So people that have left university or school and entered the labour market can't get jobs because there are less companies hiring. So even though lots of the jobs have been secured due to the furlough programme, actually it's those entrants to the job market which are finding it hardest to, to, to start work. Um, and so perhaps that speaks to this idea of employers working more closely with the state to, to create kind of opportunities where there are kind of shortfalls. Yeah, because I think we've had the kickstarting sort of um, uh, initiative started. It's, you know, and it, I think a, a couple of the companies I know have started that and, and looking at moving that forward, but that could be seen as an opportunity. Michael in the comments there, totally agree. L&D is really sort of, looking at there's going to be a significant investment um, it's restructuring it's changing it's retraining um, I've had a huge amount of opportunity or a huge amount of inquiries for people taking groups of talent you know from either you know ex-army people then retraining mm -hmm. or coming from a different um, sort of a different um, background and how do we reskill uh, and then redeploy and I think there's a huge amount of um, opportunity there for um, that our sector to be getting involved in and looking at. Um, I saw Carol Ann on there from Arnold Clark as well. You know, they really have invested in the past in terms of their um, apprentice schemes and, you know, actually have a blueprint there of a really good mm. apprentice scheme that could be rolled out. And it's those sort of things that I, I would suggest that I'm reading from the data. Um, would, would you agree that are really sort of the things that our, our market should be focusing on? Yeah, I, I, that sounds really encouraging. I mean, <clears throat> I think actually the recruitment in industry has a really kind of important role to play in this because the economy is changing and, and it will look different when we exit the crisis. Uh, we saw that chart from the Bank of England showing the extent of the change won't match that in the 80s, but nevertheless, there will be a significant reallocation of, of resources. And so matching that supply or even the education of um, the workforce for those new fangled uh, skills and demands will be really important and so I think the recruitment agency in trying to to ease those frictions will be um, you know will be really important yeah and that's what we love so I'm going to stop on a, a nice high there in terms of um, you know recognizing that you know the data is there we've been seeing it all year sometimes it, you can interpret that and look really scary or sometimes you can interpret that data and get excited about what you're going to be able to achieve next year the thing I, I like to think is that with all of that sort of data around, actually the feeling um, you know, from the recruitment sector is actually it's fared well, which is a great sight um, you know, and a, a great, um, you know, it's, it, it's a great stat to know about the sector in terms of um, you know, getting ready for that uh, kickback next year, which will come, uh, which, is, which is really good. Um, just one last then thing, and I always like to um, you know, finish up in terms of my guest, um, a couple of just things that you would say to business owners for next year, um, looking to maximise the opportunities, you know, a couple of bits of advice that you would say, go focus on that area or try to think about this, anything that you'd like to throw into the mix? Um, it's a really good question. I, I, I think that this is a just a, a huge moment in kind of economic history. And so when we begin to recover more quickly and we will recover very quickly next year and the year after yes it will take some time before we reach pre-covid levels of activity but actually the rates of growth next year and in subsequent years are going to be way above what they were before the crisis so this is going to be a period of, of flux and change and growth and disruption and i think along with all of the challenges that no one needs to be reminded about over this last year. Next year will also hold significant opportunities for those businesses that are able um, and nimble enough to, to, to find those fast growing new industries and help to support them. And that is music to our ears as that sector because we don't need any encouragement to, encouragement to, to go after an opportunity like that, which is awesome. Tom, I, I know that you're doing a lot of these things just now. Uh, we're very privileged that you've been able to step into our sector and, and help out our audience. Thank you so much for doing that today. Um, I know that you're looking forward to getting a Christmas break, like I'm sure everybody there is. It feels really weird to be saying thank you and have a nice Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah a, a, a bit early maybe, but no, thank you ever so much for inviting me on. And it's really great to um, to have the conversation um, and to, to see some really good questions from the audience. So thank you very much.
awesome. Well, you're a friend of Firefish in the recruitment sector now. So um, I know Amy will be pop popping over um, the your LinkedIn profile, I'm, I'm sure, in the comments. And likewise, um, I think we've had some requests for some of your slides. So if that's OK to share some of that, that would be amazing as well, Tom. So thank you so much. And to everybody else, thank you for following us um, throughout this mad, weird, wonderful, stressful time. Um, I really appreciate you tuning in. We've had regularly 100, 150 on our audiences every fortnight, which is brilliant. Um, this is our, our final for the season. We'll be kicking off next January on the 6th. Um, we've got Howard Greenwood from Jump Consultancy. Really looking forward to um, having him on as our guest. We'll, we'll continue the, the fortnightly crowdcast that then, because we, we, we keep getting such positive vibes from you guys that it's worthwhile and it's adding value to your businesses. Um, Howard is going to be thinking about this and actually thinking about, right, well, if you're going to go into next year, you've got to have the right team on the bus in order to maximise in those opportunities. We're going to kick off we're getting that team and uh, looking at the team building that you're going to have to be starting to do in January. But apart from that, have some time, regenerate, re <laughs> re refresh, take some time off at Christmas. I hope you've had, uh, um, you know, I hope you have a great year. And um, thank you again for following us. You know where I am if you want me to pick up on any guests or anything else. Um, and I will see you in January. Bye bye.